Well, welcome. I'm going to do my best to uh, give you the, the essential aspects of uh, my knowledge on feed forward and ratio control. I think it's uh, something that's underutilized for PID control. Uh, it never replaces the need to have uh, the PID feedback controller, although sometimes you see uh, university professors doing research thinking they can make the feed forward or their calculations so accurate uh, and comprehensive that you don't need the feedback control correction. In industrial processes, uh, the feed forward and ratio control is uh, nearly always corrected by a PID controller for some important process variable. So I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation by going to the full screen mode here. And feel free to interrupt me um, as as we go, if you have a quest, pressing question, otherwise uh, we can uh, address questions at the end of the presentation. Unlike most of my presentations, I think this one I should be able to do in less than an hour based on the number of slides I have, anyway. Okay, well, and this is me. There's a couple of key websites here for my Control Talk blog that also allows you to get to Control Talk column, and then the ISA Mentor Program um, question and answer link there that also uh, allows you to get then to the individual posts uh, that have been made as part of the question and answer uh, capability we really need to promote more. There was a, a lot of questions posed and when the Mentor Program started, but um, most recently, uh, we haven't seen that. It's a little bit of a challenge to make the questions uh, general, generic enough so that they're not product uh, or model number specific so much. And uh, of course, you don't want to disclose any proprietary process information. But you know, it's not actually that's not as challenging as you might think. So what is the most prevalent upset? In the process industry, nearly all inputs that affect production are process streams and utility streams. Often we think of these as liquids and gases, but they, they could be solids. And in fact, uh, they, they could be sheets. Uh, so we have to look at a broader view of what we mean by stream. The process flow diagram reveals the effects of streams on plant performance, but unfortunately, it, it is outdated. And that's why we need to have feedback correction. Uh, I remember when I was teaching at Washington University and I was trying to explain feedback control and one of the students said, well, why do you need it? You just set the flows per the process flow diagram and everything's okay. Um, then also in developing questions for the uh, certification of automation professionals, uh, that program, one of the people that was helping develop the questions, I was saying, hey, how we need use micro, uh, say, Coriolis meters to give density measurements that can provide an inferred composition of reactants or, or streams, particularly if there's you know two major components. And he said, well, why do you do that? Uh, you don't need to do that. The composition is what is on the PFD. Well, uh, it would be nice if that was the case, but it's not. And one of the uh, things that is really overlooked is the potential for uh, for updating a process flow diagram online um, by the understanding you, you gain from your feedback corrections. And uh, particularly, you see it in, when you start doing the feed forward and ratio control. So changes in stream flow are usually fast, and and that's why you know we tend to focus on that because the faster the change, the more difficult it is for the PID controller to deal with it. So they're usually fast, and the degree of disruption is determined first of all, uh, quite often by the lack of automation. You know, an operator is making a manual 
action. Maybe there is automation, but he prefers to have it in the manual mode because he doesn't understand the control system or something's not quite right in the tuning. Uh, so he uh, decides he's going to do manual control, and his actions are very abrupt and disruptive, generally speaking. And then, of course, when you have uh, actions being taken by your safety instrumented system and, and your sequences, they tend to be very abrupt. I mean, you have interactions going on where you have some continual fighting between controllers. And then you have abrupt actions caused by the fact that there's not a continuous response for the measurement uh, or the valve. And it, it gets abrupt, it takes steps, which is indicated by the resolution, or it gets kind of, the response is kind of scattered in terms of it not being repeatable. And then in particular with flow measurements, we have a problem with rangeability where as you get down to low flows, uh, the signal can get very erratic. And, and the best thing we do in some cases, like with vortex meters, is actually drop out the signal. Um, but uh, you, it really uh, starts out perhaps as seeing more noise, but then uh, the signal gets very erratic and disruptive. And we have to take that in mind, keep that in mind when we uh, consider doing feed forward control, particularly since we're thinking of flow as being the primary feed forward signal. And so we need to try and improve the rangeability and not discussed here, but one of the techniques that's been used, uh, particularly in drum level control, because uh, they're, they're using feed forward there, uh, you know, in terms of ratioing feed water flow to steam flow, but they end up getting into rangeability limits because they're using DP uh, measurements in particular. So what they do is when they get to the point where the flow measurement rangeability is no longer sufficient uh, at that low flow, they switch to a calculation made on valve position. Now, the more linear the valve is and the more responsive the valve is in terms of having minimal stiction and backlash, uh, the better is that calculation. And so that is one general technique. Of course, you would prefer that the flow measurement have uh, the best rangeability and that generally is associated with uh, magnetic flow meters and uh, especially with Coriolis meters being the uh, exceptional example of how um, great the rangeability and repeatability and maintainability is. Uh, often you don't need to do, if you get the right Coriolis meter, uh, you don't need to do much after getting it initially calibrated, and even the installation requirements are rather minimal. Uh, and then uh, there's PID tuning, the fact that people, um, you know, are challenged by uh, there being hundreds of tuning rules. Um, and there being so, such a variety of process dynamics and then complications associated with valves that are not responding. Uh, or measurements that are not responding either in a timely fashion or a repeatable fashion, uh, you know, it, it's quite a challenge. And so tuning upsets are, uh, um, are, are also a, a concern. So feed forwards are most needed for abrupt flow or abrupt flow taking into account the stream conditions, uh, doing a more sophisticated ca uh, calculation, taking into account what you know is the stream composition and temperature. Temperature is pretty straightforward, but the composition might require, as I mentioned, a, a Coriolis uh, flow meter. One of the big questions is the feed forward multiplier versus summer. And when I first started to look at this, uh, you know, as a young engineer, boy, that was a long time ago, um, back in the 1970s, late 70s, the conventional wisdom uh, was out there that you do a plot of uh, the uh, of, of the desired manipulated flow versus feed forward flow, and if uh, the intercept is changing, you use a feed forward summer. If the slope is changing, you use a feed forward multiplier. And that's still what's out there in the literature. Unfortunately, that's not really the case. Uh, and 
Uh, I'm going to try and explain when you use a feed-forward multiplier versus a feed-forward summer, but I'm going to start out the discussion right away, unless we're talking about uh, speeds and sheet lines and solid conveyors and stuff like that. Uh, um, in most cases, we're talking about a feed-forward summer being used for correcting the feed-forward signal. In other words, the uh, PID controller um, it ha is output is summed uh, with the feed-forward signal, and, and what the PID controller is then doing is a plus or minus uh, correction in that summation. Uh, and uh, we'll get into a little reasons why this is the most practical thing for a lot of liquid uh, streams, particularly. Uh, when there is no secondary flow or speed controller, the feed-forward summer in, a, in the pre primary controller is used uh, to directly manipulate a valve position or power input signal. In these cases, uh, often the secondary controller is too slow, and this is especially what we see if we have pressure control. Uh, whether it's on a vessel or on a pipeline, uh, you know, unless it's maybe uh, a very large vessel, a very long pipeline, uh, we tend not to uh, have a, a secondary flow loop, and we tend to go directly to, uh, from the pressure controller output to, to a valve. Of course, there's always exceptions uh, in industrial process control, and that's what makes it interesting and challenging. When there is a flow or speed controller, uh, and we have cascade control, uh, so there is a flow or speed controller as a secondary uh, controller. People sometimes call that a inner uh, con loop controller. Uh, ratio control is predominantly used uh, where a secondary flow or speed controller set point is manipulated uh, uh, to follow something that's leading the way, a leader flow or speed that is multiplied uh, by the desired ratio. So we have this concept of leader and follower. Uh, in, the, in the past, we tried to come up, well, you know, how do we kind of generalize to what is setting the direction initially? And, and sometimes uh, it, it, a wild flow was said, but you know, wild is not always the case. I mean, this flow, leader flow, can be set very legitimately and intelligently, and it's not really wild, so necessarily. So I, I uh, like the word leader flow. Uh, ratio control is used to assist uh, the primary PIDs uh, that are trying to do what's most important, which is to try and control a composition or a level, a pH, or temperature, or, or quality of uh, what's associated with the, with the product. In ratio control, the leader and follower flow first go to a ratio block whose output is the input to a bias and gain block. Now, this is the way we set it up. Maybe in some systems, uh, the ratio and the bias and gain is all in one block. Whose output then is the cascade set point for a flow or speed uh, secondary controller as part of this cascade control system. Uh, the set point of each block, whether it's a ratio, ratio or bias, can be set by the operator in the auto mode or automatically corrected by this primary PID that has got the job of trying to make sure that you're doing tight control of composition, level, pH, temperature, quality, and then you're operating uh, in the cascade mode. Now, the reason you want that auto mode is because the operator, if something goes wrong with the primary PID, or, but more importantly, when you're starting up a unit operation, and in particular distillation columns, it, it turns out you really just can't go on temperature or composition control right away. You have to get the column up to operating conditions. And uh, so these columns are, and, and many other unit operations are started up uh, in, the, in the auto mode. Or maybe uh, the, the set point is being set intelligently based on some se sequential knowledge of what needs to be done, but it's not really in the cascade mode. 
which is what happens when you get uh, to the normal operating conditions. So manipulation of the primary PID um, of either the bias set point or ratio set point is a feed, effectively a feed forward summer and feed forward multiplier respectively. So if you're manipulating a bias set point, it's a feed forward summer. If you're manipulating a, uh, a ratio set point, you're effectively got a feed forward multiplier. The use of the ratio and bias and gain blocks to, uh, provide the operator visibility and accessibility and ratio control, particularly important for understanding and for procedural automation, uh, uh, procedural automation is what I mentioned before, and there's actually an ISA standard on it for, uh, where you have sequences intelligently set, determining, hey, we need to preemptively set uh, a flow, uh, typically to some value as we get through the startup or uh, for changes in product or for some abnormal conditions. It's also called state-based control, and was uh, very heavily developed and touted by Dow. Um, but now it's an ISA standard, and I, I've done it quite a bit in Monsanto and Solutia. I didn't have a name for it, but basically what I was doing was procedural automation or state-based control. Um, the bias set point is manipulated for volumes with back mixing and do and back mixing. Okay, that means that well, obviously you see an agitator in the vessel has got back mixing, but not realized if you've got a column, there's a lot of mixing going on to, you know, the fact that we've got uh, bubbles going up and we've got um, reflux coming down to downcomers and. Uh, you know, there's a lot of mixing going on in columns as well on each tray. And then it gets, of course, you got the trays in series, gets a little complicated. Um, but with vessels and columns in general, whether it's due to literally be seeing an agitator or whether there being uh, turbulence due to uh, streams, uh, recirculation streams, uh, sometimes eductors are used, uh, whatever, uh, we consider those as, ha as having back mixing. And there we, we see where we are correcting the bias uh, set point and feed forward control. Um, the actual and desired ratio of set point are displayed during startup until the process of the normal operating point. The primary controller is often in manual. In this case, the operator runs with a manually set bias and ratio without correction. Or, as we mentioned before, there is state-based control or procedural automation to do this on a sequential, intelligent basis. And I think there's a lot of opportunities that to make startups much faster and, and reduce the amount of waste um, and inefficiency during startup. So we have uh, ratios here, there, and everywhere. If you look at the process flow diagram, and whether it's a liquid stream, a solid stream, or gas stream, uh, there's a, a ratio. If you consider that you know the flows of these streams, how how they affect each other. In other words, if you double one flow, you may need to double another flow, whether it's a process stream or a utility stream. Uh, so let's look at some individual examples. For blend composition control, we have an additive to feed flow-to-flow uh, -flow ratio. Uh, for column temperature control, there's a lot of uh, feed forward controls. And my uh, my protege associate, well, it's not a not a protege, but really my my resource and associate. Uh, uh, Jerry Tolliver that I worked with for uh, 30 years at uh, Monsanto, he was, I think, the world's uh, expert uh, in how you get more out of distillation columns, and it was principally by adding feed forward control in. And here you can see we have a distal to feed, reflux to distillate, reflux to feed, steam to feed, and bottoms to feed, and, and these are flow to flow ratios. And the dynamics get a little challenging with columns because if you have a very big column, uh, the response time, uh, say for the primary PID loop in terms of uh, composition, either directly measured or inferred from temperature, uh, could take hours to shifts and even some cases days to line out. So uh, they, they, that can be very slow and challenging in terms of um, un understanding and identifying the dynamics. And then you have combustion and temperature control where you have an air to fuel uh, as a flow to flow ratio. Uh, drum level control, uh, we have a feed forward to steam, a flow to flow ratio. Uh, 
we have extruder quality control. And here, a form, I don't know how much literally this is done, but in uh, uh, at least in the literature, and, and literature as published by people in the industry, is saying what needs to be done. They talk about there being a ratio of extruder power to mixer power being maintained as being most indicative of what you need to be doing on a preemptive basis to maintain quality, uh, and particularly as it relates um, uh, to uh, the product that comes out of the extruder and then maybe even out of the sheet line downstream. Uh, we have heat exchanger, temperature control, coolant to feed, uh, and it's a flow-to-flow -flow, uh, ratio. And here, this may not really be uh, so much back-mixed uh, control. Um, neutralizer pH control, uh, reagent to feed, uh, and that's a flow-to-flow -flow ratio. If it's a static mixer, it's really not back-mixed, but uh, if it's a vessel uh, or a column, uh, there's back-mixing. Uh, reaction rate control, catalyst to reactant, uh, and here uh, the catalyst being a solid is often maybe conveyed in or is somehow put in by manipulating speed, so it's a speed to flow ratio. Um, and reactors uh, can be like a plug flow, very fast plug flow, particularly if these are gas reactants where uh, the reactants only spend a few seconds in the reactor, uh, and that was the case in what was Monsanto Solution in, a, in uh, some of their fluidized bed reactors. Uh, and then also there was some uh, nylon uh, reactors that were like pipeline reactors, and, and there's no back mixing there, and, but there the amount of time uh, resonance time that's spent uh, of the reactants, uh, maybe minutes. Um, but we have this uh, ratio if we're adding catalysts. If we're, uh, if we're trying to keep the reactants, and often we have more than one reactant, uh, I would think, uh, and uh, for, uh, for reaction control, there is a flow-to-flow -flow ratio. Uh, so uh, we move on and consider sheet webs and film line machine direction gauge control. Uh, where we actually measure the thickness of uh, the sheet uh, by um, uh, usually a device by MeasureX that transverses the sheet and, and, and gives us a sheet thickness, and then we may be adjusting a, uh, a roller or a pump speed ratio. Uh, if, uh, if we're talking about the thickness changing in the machine direction, and, and I kind of maybe misled the discussion there initially. If it's that we're talking about the measure X thing, that's going across a sheet, and so that's a cross direction gauge control. And in that case, we're manipulating the dies typically that squeeze down on the stuff that's been extruded that goes into the sheet. And that can be literally done by an actuator, or it can be done um, thermally by changing uh, the temperature there at the die. And, and there, is die, there may be many dies. There could be uh, extruding or squeezing uh, the polymer as it goes into the sheet. Um, and, and this is done for plastic sheets. It's done for paper sheets. And uh, there could be anywhere from 20 to 100 of these dies being manipulated. And there and may be one PID controller for each one of these dies manipulating how much it's squeezing down on that sheet. So that's an across direction control. And, uh, you know, how does the sheet thickness uh, change across the, the, the sheet? Here we were talking about the machine direction as we go down the length of the sheet, and um, we, we want to um, keep uniformity there as well, and that can be uh, assisted by doing uh, roller to pump speed to speed ratio control. Uh, then there's something I'm not that familiar with, but I, I did a control talk column. Uh, it's a guy from uh, a local business partner, uh, Terry Schmelich. And uh, he, he was showing how you do lime to liquor ratio control for slaker conductivity uh, control. Uh, spin line fiber diameter gauge control, and, and we, we, 
once made a lot of uh, fibers, uh, spinning fibers in Monsanto, and uh, we did winder to pump speed to speed ratio control. Of course, you have header pressure control, uh, quite common with everybody in their utility systems, and we're going to get into that more uh, more exactly because uh, there was a recent application here where we used a virtual plant for that. Uh, for level and pressure, uh, it's really nice if we if we deal with mass flows with the same units, the theoretical ratio is simply one. So the key here is, hey, keep the, the units the same and use mass flow, and uh, we can simplify the feed forward gain uh, uh, greatly uh, and 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 greatly improve the understanding. Okay, now this shows uh, the original relationship um, of uh, where we where we're plotting at uh, the follower flower speed versus the leader flower speed, um, and and the leader is you know our feed forward signal, and the follower is trying to you know to stay in the right ratio uh, with that. And uh, as shown here uh, is what was typically given as the case, uh, st strictly speaking, that uh, if you need to shift the intercept of that, uh, or correct the intercept of that original relationship, then you do a bias correction um, as shown in uh, that kind of light blue. Uh, now, if the slope changes, uh, then you do a ratio correction, and, which is a feed-forward multiplier, whereas the bias correction was a feed-forward summer. Well, yeah, that's uh, part of the story. Um, but but uh, if we, it turns out, I guess to kind of jump forward, if if we're talking about solids flow, plug flow processes uh, without back mixing. You know, something in a pipeline or something that's solid. Uh, yeah, we we are talking about um, primarily uh, doing a, a ratio correction, a feed fold multiplier. Um, but um, actually, uh, at least in my ex uh, experience, most most processes um, actually benefited from. The bias correction because uh, they were on volumes, um, and and it really wasn't uh, plug flow. Anyway, we'll get into more details on that. So automatic correction of cascade ratio set point feed forward multiplier creates a gain factor in the open loop that is proportional to flow. Now that can be good or bad. For plug flow processes, this multiplier factor cancels out a process gain, and you'd have to get into the ordinary differential equation to see this, that is inversely proportional flow. And I do have a very simplification um, of that available as a file, and it's been posted online a number of times and referred to on the Control Global site. And uh, it's also been referred to and given in some of the ISA books uh, done in the last uh, five years. So for plug flow processes, uh, the, the fact that we're changing the uh, gain in the loop by doing this multiplication uh, that is proportional to flow cancels out a process gain that is inversely proportional flow. So, you know, it sounds great, and it is great for... Uh, plug flow processes and solids flows. Um, uh, for back mix processes, the process time constant being inversely proportional to flow cancels out this process gain nonlinearity, where the process gain is inversely proportional to flow in, in terms of how we do PID tuning. And this is what's not understood out there. So for backmix processes, if we start using a feed for a multiplier and a ratio, correcting the ratio set point, we're actually uh, disrupting the PID tuning. Um, 
And, and that's because uh, the PID gain is proportional to the process time constant and divided by the process gain. There's other factors involved, but this is, you know, it's proportional to that ratio of the process time constant divided by the process gain. In this case, the correction of the ratio creates a residual nonlinearity that adversely affects PID tuning for backmix processes. The primary PID output scaling is more critical and prone to error when correcting a ratio set point. So unless you know for sure that you need to correct a ratio set point, uh, you're going to have less problems in terms of the industrial setup of it by using a feed-forward summer and, uh, and correcting um, a, a bias set point. The output scaling can be as simple as a minus 50 to plus 50 percent of the secondary PID scale when correcting a bias set point. Whereas if you're correcting a ratio set point, you have to very intelligently set that scale. Finally, making corrections in ratio control are simply associated with offsets from bias errors in the flow measurements or unmeasured loads. What people don't realize is that the, the um, change in the ratio slope um, due to changes in the span or calibration span of a measurement not being quite right or very minimal, what more often is the case, particularly with pH, is uh, that there is a, a bias error. And, and even if there is a span error, often we can best, particularly in pH, deal with that at our particular set point by doing a bias correction which leads you again to why we would use a feed-forward summer unless we have more intelligence saying that we shouldn't. So when in doubt, which is best, you automatically bias the, uh, correct the bias set point. You can solely adapt what is uncorrected, whether it's a ratio or bias set point, by the use of a generic interval-only controller to reduce uh, the correction that the primary PID is having to do. And it's pretty simple if it's a, yeah, you know, if it's a feed for its summer, that correction should be zero on the minus 50 to plus 50 percent scale. And so you have another controller looking at that and saying, oh, well, why you always, why is that output always say plus 20 percent? I, I can, I can gradually correct a ratio uh, set point that will allow the bias correction uh, to go to zero. Okay, so uh, I really like this diagram uh, for so many purposes in that it, it, it tries to show, the, it can't show all of the dynamics, but it tries to show uh, the, some of the biggest contributions to the dynamics in a, in a control loop. And, and so the, the main four parts of a control loop is the valve or variable speed drive. And some people get a little bit upset if I call it a variable speed drive even though it's manipulating speed. They want to call it a variable frequency drive because it clues them into more about how they're setting up the inverter and, and, the, and the control there and the type of inverter. Anyway, uh, but you have a, a valve or, or speed being manipulated. Um, and then you have the process, and you got dynamics, and there's usually more than one delay and more than one lag. And here we're simplifying delay to being dead time and lag to meaning time constant. And uh, we've got usually at least two different sources in the process of that. It could be due to mixing. It could be due to injection. Um, piping uh, or dip tubes, uh, whatever, or it could be due to thermal lags and and, and, and delays and lags associated with the coil or jackets. Uh, and we have a process gain, and and then we get well. Now we got to measure that, so we we have a delay associated with the measurements. Maybe often a couple of them. At least we. You know, we got a delay and a lag associated with the sensor. Then we have maybe another delay 
associated with the measurement. That's the transmitter a contribution. Uh, you know, how fast is it updating? And, and then there's a damping setting in these transmitters, and uh, which is really a time constant or lag. And uh, in some cases, it's very important for that to be at its minimum value. In fact, um, I did a control talk column with one person who said they could no longer use this one vendor, and I won't say who that was, because their default value for the transmitter damping was like between one and two seconds. And, um, you know, for the compressor control and the pressure control associated with it, they needed uh, the minimum damping setting. And and so they would, uh, you know, before it was installed, it would be set at the minimum. Or it would happen in the middle of the night if they need to replace a transmitter. The person doing the maintenance didn't realize the consequences of uh, not setting that to its minimum, and he put in a new one, and it was set at one to two seconds, and then uh, the compressor would shut down inevitably. So it's a, it can get very important depending upon, you know, how how much lag and delay there is in the rest of the process. And, and one of the values of this is seeing what is the relative contributions to the total delay, which is what's shown at the bottom there. We can, uh, you know, the total delay in that loop, we've got to sum up all these pure delays. And then we got to take the fraction of the small time constants that become effective delays. And uh, you know, way back when in the 70s, these guys, which which are now fully appreciated, uh, Ziegler and Nichols came up with a very nice uh, plot of uh, what that is uh, in terms of what that fraction changes as it uh, in relative to the size of the small time constant to the large time constant. And here I say that that Y factor changes at the very bottom here of this diagram from 0 0.28 if the ratio is 1 of the small to large to 0 0.88 if the ratio of the small uh, to large time constants is 0 0.01. So you see for very small time constants, we can effectively say, hey, they're like dead time. Oh, well, we we're always underestimating the dead time, so if it's a small time constant, I like to just say, hey, hey that's that's effectively uh, dead time. And so, you you know, the most important thing, of course, in the loop is the total dead time. It's actually the easiest thing to test. Um, and uh, here we see all the different sources of that dead time. Uh, because once we know the total dead time, we can make some judgments and we can easily see, you know, how long does it take to, if we make a change, whether set point or output, before we start to see the change in the process variable. And then we can use that as a guide to what the filter settings might be and uh, what the reset settings might be. Um, and even uh, like if you're using lambda tuning, what the lambda should be do, because they're all uh, factors uh, of these uh, of the dead time. Oh, yeah, and also PID execution. And uh, of course, we've, we've mentioned this before in previous uh, webinars. And Michelle Ruel did a, as well in his webinar how important it is. Recognize the dead time, and then that gives you a key as to how you can set different things associated with PID and, uh, and the measurements and how, you know, is your valve too slow? Is your measurement too slow? All, all those things. And uh, the, the thing is that we need to be talking intelligently and realize there is a uh, open loop gain that's the largest gain. It could be anywhere that you, hopefully it's in the process and it's that primary lag as shown. So it slows down the upset, but it could be anywhere, either slowing down the recognition in the measurement or in the correction by being in the valve or in the controller, again, slowing down the probably most likely uh, the recognition of the upset. Um, anyway, uh, I like this diagram and it allows you to, to talk intelligent and terminology uh, about the effect of different things. Uh, and you need to really uh, look at process gains, process time constants, process dead times. Unfortunately, people use that term to really mean the whole loop. And so instead of saying the open loop gain, they'll say process gain. Instead of saying the largest lag or the open loop time constant, they'll say process time constant. And instead of saying the total loop dead time, they will say the process dead time. And so I think that's uh, dis uh, discouraging because uh, you need to really think about all these other contributions to the dynamics. 
Okay, so let's look at a load upset because we're focusing on feed forward control. And uh, we gotta make sure that the feed forward correction arrives at the same point as the load upset at the same time. And, and this is where we get into how do we set the feed forward gain and dynamic compensation, realizing as shown here for the load upset that there is a delay, a lag, and a gain uh, associated with that. So how do we improve feed forward control? We need to understand dynamic compensation. And this is perhaps the biggest reason why feed forward control is not effectively used. We don't know how to set that. And I, I was just on a project uh, where perhaps the most well-known supplier, um, you know, I, I haven't used it before, but a well-known supplier of tuning software, uh, and it's an independent supplier, and, you know, it's not associated with any uh, DCS or PLC system. Uh, we tried to use it for uh, getting the dynamic compensation of feed forward, and the, the instructions were just bizarre at best. I mean, uh, and even misleading. And when we talked, to, you know, to uh, like the representative for that, and he says, "Well, we we really haven't seen doing much in terms of." feed forward dynamic compensation. So he kind of admitted that they really don't have it, uh, the instructions or the setup there for you to do that. And so it's like one problem caused another. By not having it, you don't see it. By not seeing it, you don't have it. But anyways, we're going to try and show you uh, what you need to do and what the consequences are of not doing that feed forward dynamic compensation. And in fact, this misunderstanding of the is and the lack of being able to do this dynamic compensation is the primary reason why model predictive control is have been uh, effectively used, particularly for small operations, uh, where you could have done maybe feed forward, because the model predictive control will automatically identify the dynamics and compensate for that in in its algorithm. And so you you just need to do uh, the testing. Uh, that that allows that automatic identification and that automatic integration of the of the dynamics needed so that you uh, have a good um, correction um, based on that uh, disturbance or upset. So here we want to look at what do we do if we're going to have to do this on an individual PID loop. And uh, we have some individual rules here. The feed forward lag should be set equal to the load lag, which is uh, it's in the disturbance variable path if we go back to that block diagram. Uh, the feed forward lead that and is set equal to the loop lag. In other words, wherever the biggest lag is to get the, that correction into the process at the same point as the disturbance, the biggest lag there uh, and maybe it's the secondary lag in the controller if there's not much of a sec process, excuse me, uh, and not much of a secondary lag in the process, it, it could be uh, the valve. And that's actually what we saw in a big application of feed for control that we'll get into for header pressure control. Uh, the lead was really set uh, based on uh, the lag in the control valve. And even though we had made these control valves much more responsive, it still was important. Uh, to set that lead. The feed forward delay is much more understandable in terms of it, it, it's the load delay uh, minus the, the loop delay. In other words, you're hoping that it takes longer for the disturbance to get into the process uh, uh, at that point, common point, uh, as your correction. <laughs> if it takes longer for your correction to get in uh, than a disturbance to, to that common point, you're in trouble because you're going to be late. And, and there's been some situations uh, where that was the case, and I really feed forward did more harm than good. But there is a way of uh, dealing with that that we will mention, and that what you can do is if that disturbance is a, is a result of a set point being changed, uh, you can put a delay on that set point. And so the operator asks for the set point to be changed. So, uh, and maybe there's a delay, and it uh, takes uh, then 10 seconds for the actual set point to be changed that's causing the disturbance. 
Well, you know, I don't think the operator is going to be too upset about that. And what it does is create a larger load delay and allows us to make sure that the feed forward signal can arrive in time and is um, and not too late. And then the feed forward gain, and we can look at that as being a ratio of load gain uh, to the loop gain. So what you need to do is seek instruction on how to use the auto-tuning software to identify the dynamic compensation. In other words, uh, uh, you need to do a step disturbance variable test just like you did for the manipulated variable, the controller output. Now, that's what's required if you're going to do a model predictive control, and so people don't question it so much. But when you say, oh, i got to do it for feed-forward control, they say, oh, I don't, I, I don't know if I can change that, that upset flow. Well, you don't have to change it that much, um, but you do need to change it in order for you to identify uh, what is uh, the load lag and the load delay and what is the load gain. And then if you treat that uh, disturbance variable like you did uh, if it was a manipulated variable, in other words, the controller output, uh, then you can use the tuning software. So um, what's most important? You ensure the feed forward does not arrive too soon or is too great, or counter the current trajectory causing an inverse response. Now, I added in this last phrase because uh, Terry Tolliver found out in distillation columns where they commonly use uh, feed forward control for feed changes, he said in some cases there's things going on in that column where the per the, the excursion, the prevalent excursion that's occurring at the time that you change that feed to the column is <clears throat> opposite of the direction uh, that the feed change is going to uh, cause as a disturbance. So if you use feed forward, you're actually going to promote the excursion that is currently uh, occurring in the column. And so he added an intelligence in there that said, hey, if you're going in a direction where if I do a feed for a correction, it's going to make it go more in that direction, we don't want to do that. Uh, that's a much finer point that is uh, not discussed, uh, I think, anywhere, uh, except it was discussed in, in uh, meetings uh, within Monsanto and Solutions. Um, but here to summarize more conventional wisdom is that use a slightly larger feed for delay and lag than estimated. And, and so, you know, uh, and, and we, we want to do the estimation for the worst case. And we, we would still say, well, well, we don't know things perfectly, so let's have it arrive a, 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 a little bit later. Uh, you, and, and even more importantly, is use a considerably lower feed forward gain than estimated, um, like a minus 40%. But if you really do know the, uh, the gain, load, and loop gains extremely well and extremely confident, uh, this could be reduced. But you would start out not assuming that, and then maybe you can try and make it more accurate as time went on. Uh, so, uh, this last thing I added, intelligently suppress the feed forward. If the current tra trajectory is in the opposite uh, direction um, of uh, what, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the feed forward is, is, is or, or the, excuse me, the upset is causing. As a, and so you don't want to make things worse by then using feed forward. So let's look at uh, some test cases I did uh, uh, where uh, we had, uh, first of all, the brown uh, plot where the feed forward was off. And so this is a disturbance without feed forward. And so we see the full extent of it. This is a moderate self-regulating process. By moderate, I mean the time constant's not that much greater than the dead time. In this case, as shown up here in the upper right corner, uh, the trend that the loop dead time is 10 seconds, the loop lag is 20 seconds. 
And we see that if we're, uh, if the if the feed forward delay is a mismatch is a minus 10 seconds and it's arriving too soon, how we've created inverse response where the initial where the response of from the feed forward correction is opposite of the uh, uh, correction from uh, opposite of the response from from the upset and and that's very confusing. Uh, now we see that if the feed forward delay mismatch was uh, zero seconds and everything else was perfectly matched in the feed forward, we got the black trend and it's doing a great job of eliminating the disturbance. And then we see uh, in the red plot, what if the feed forward delay mismatch is a plus 10 seconds? It's arriving too late. Uh, we reduced the peak error, but then we've created a, an undershoot there and a, a little bit of an oscillation. So that's not real good either. Um, but uh, I think is less disruptive than the purple plot that had inverse response. Now, if we're looking at integrating uh, near integrating processes, and by near integrating, I mean it's almost like a near in integrating process, and that is kind of has a very large time constant compared to the dead time. In this case, uh, as seen here, the loop lag is 100 seconds versus the loop dead time of 10 seconds. And again, brown is if we had no feed for it. <clears throat> Purple is if uh, the delay uh, was a minus 10 seconds in the mismatch, and whoops, and then uh, if there was a perfect miss, uh, you know, no mismatch, perfect dynamic compensation, we got the black, and then the red if we had the delay uh, set too large and it arrived uh, too late. And you can see it again, it creates some oscillation, but maybe that's better than no feed for it. And um, here we go for, let's see, what uh, to effect the feed delay and near integrating. Uh, well, I, I kind of got these out of uh, normal order, but anyway, here it's for moderate self-regulating process delay and mismatch. <clears throat> And oops, I guess um, I have a problem here with the buttons, but anyway, uh, here we have this, the effect of the lag uh, mismatch. And then uh, let's talk about gain. And, and this is why I, I, I want you to be very careful about uh, not overestimating the gain. We can see here that for a purple plot, if we have the gain mismatch uh, plus 50%, uh, we we've really converted created a, a bad situation in terms of a disturbance there uh, in, in the opposite direction of what we would have had and um, if we if we uh, underestimate the gain it's it's not so bad in fact it's not even oscillating uh, we don't get the full value of the feed forward but uh, uh, we uh, we have um, you know, not as good performance as we got, of course, with the black, but the perfect uh, dynamic compensation. And here we see a similar situation, but to a lesser degree uh, for the uh, near integrating process where the loop lag is 100 seconds, loop dead times 10 seconds. Okay, now we had a big application using the virtual plant of feed forward and decoupler, and we had a lot of disturbances. In fact, uh, we had uh, over 30 disturbances, and here I just showed two. And we had to do dynamic compensation, um, and uh, we were uh, what we're doing is a feed forward to a letdown valve based on disturbances in terms of either a, a steam flow generation or steam flow usage changing on the header. And the neat thing is, if we used uh, mass flow, common mass flow units, the feed for theoretical feed forward gain was one, and. Uh, and 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 uh, we and if you would set the feed forward scale based on the capacity of the linear uh, uh, letdown valve. So uh, as mentioned here, we could have inserted if we had to. Uh, if the load delay is less than loop delay, it can be inserted set point train that is triggering the disturbance. Uh, we didn't need to do that. Um, and here we're taking it in as a, 
uh, that feed forward signal into a feed forward summer. And uh, we started out with a feed forward gain of about 0.8, and, and then in some cases we inched it up to 0.9. And uh, we, we set the feed forward scale intelligently to match the uh, letdown valve. And the letdown valve uh, should be linear, and it should be precise, and it should be fast. And what was found, even after making these valves uh, precise and fast, uh, that response time was still around 86% uh, response time was around uh, four seconds. And we found that we needed a lead on the feed forward of about four seconds. And um, the lag on the feed forward, at least with what we were using for its implementation in terms of the lead lag, needed to always be there to screen out noise and, and, not to, and, and to kind of prevent an erratic signal. So we would always have a, a lag uh, of a tenth of the lead setting. So in this case, where the lead was four seconds, we would set the lag as uh, as um, uh, maybe 0.4 seconds to make the, make the signal changes uh, for the feed forward from the lead lag uh, to be uh, smoother. If you didn't have linear valves, either on your disturbances or didn't have flow measurements and you had nonlinear valves there, or if you had nonlinear uh, uh, letdown valve, then you need to do signal characterization, and this provides the details for that. Now let's look at uh, how the blocks are basically set up there in terms of a ratio and a lead lag block. Uh, and here we're doing adaptive correction uh, uh, of the ratio, which means uh, the PID that's the um, in trying to take care of the process variable of interest is uh, doing a bias set point correction. And so what's left for adaption uh, is the ratio set point. And here we, we show the primary PID being on the left there for the process controller, making that bias correction. And uh, it's doing it uh, by changing uh, in the bias and gain uh, station, the cascade bias set point. And uh, the output of the bias and gain station becomes uh, the cascade set point of the secondary uh, flow or speed controller. Um, and uh, then there is an adaption going on by another PID added at the very bottom of this diagram that very slowly says, hey, uh, I want to make that uh, bias correction as close to zero as possible. And so I'm going to slowly adjust uh, the cascade ratio set point to do that. And so at the very top of this diagram are those examples uh, of we're doing this. Um, and uh, here we we show the the other case uh, where uh, the primary PID controller for principally plug flow volumes and solids is correcting uh, a, a ratio set point or the ratio block in the cascade mode, and and then the adaptation is being uh, done to make uh, the 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 bias be more intelligent in the bias and gain block so that the primary PID correction to the ratio set point is um, minimal. And um, in this case, uh, uh, you know, it may be the ratio correction, depending on how you scale, it could be you know, saying we want a, a zero correction, maybe that's a one factor. Anyway, uh, this shows uh, the setup for that. And, we, and again, we use the terms leader and follower flows. Now, this shows the steam header. And just to give you a little bit of background here, the idea was uh, to maximize cogen steam because they're permitted to use a, a maximum. And uh, and they want to ma make sure they're, they're using up to the limit. But if they exceed the limit, then they get into trouble. Uh, so uh, we we want to maximize it, and uh, what's done here then is uh, to make sure that uh, we use feed forward uh, to take care of upsets, but also then use a uh, um, 
signal selection and override controller that will, as necessary, add, add more or less steam being generated from the boiler pressure uh, controller here that would normally be uh, manipulating that. And, and normally only a boiler pressure be manipulated on the header pressure control if it sagged too much. I only have two headers shown here. And in fact, there was like four headers and a decoupler was also a feed forward signal and needed no dynamic compensation. In other words, for a lower header let down valve changing position, why not change an upper header let down position change so that you don't upset uh, the, the upper header. So in other words, as the let down valve to the lower pressure header changes, why not immediately change let down position uh, from the uh, high to medium pressure header and uh, so that you don't upset the medium pressure header from uh, the letdown valve to the uh, low pressure header uh, changing. And there the dynamic compensation is zero if you have uh, valves that are uh, linear and, and, and have a very fast time response and the same, same time response. And uh, otherwise, the dynamic compensation for the feed forward summer. Turns out uh, that the process dynamics was negligible. Uh, as it often is in a header system like this, and all came down to what are the dynamics of the uh, valve response. And that's where I mentioned we use a lead of four seconds and a lag of 0.4 seconds on the feed forward signals that were uh, going uh, to uh, preemptively set a letdown valve based on changes in either steam generation or steam usage. Here we have. Uh, a reactor control and we are ratioing uh, reactants. Uh, what is not commonly known is that if you, if you have the same set point filter on, uh, the, uh, on each uh, reactant flow, uh, they arrive then at the same time, assuming that there's no injection delays like you might get with pH system. And as a result, uh, you don't need to use dynamic compensation and uh, it simplifies everything. Now, the other way of doing this is by lambda tuning and tuning all the reactant flow controllers that have the same uh, lambda uh, set point response. But I like that the set point filters because you can use the individual tuning to maximize rejection of pressure disturbances in that loop and then uh, just using the, the uh, equal set point filters to make sure that uh, changes in reactant flow arrive at the same point and same time in the reactor. Now we get into the last four cases, and I'm sorry that we're running over here, but you know, we get into distillation columns, and now I'm gonna show the four major types of column control schemes, and, and whether you use one or the other, I've kind of keyed on, uh, if you're doing top temperature control and you have a small distillate flow, uh, you may not then be able to use level control to manipulate the uh, receiver level control adequately if you have a very small distillate flow that it's trying to manipulate. And so uh, in that case, um, uh, we, we have the distillate flow manipulating uh, the reflux flow. And uh, now the temperature controller is manipulating the distillate flow. There's a feed forward of distillate to feed flow ratio. Um, but you change that distillate flow, you really are not going to affect the column until you change the reflux flow. So some people would add in another feed forward there to have a ratio of reflux to distillate flow. Uh, but the other thing you really you could do that is quite effective in, in other ways is to tune that uh, level controller on the receiver very tightly so that small changes in uh, receiver level control immediately translate to reflux control. So as you change the disk lift flow, you know, change in level and you get then through tight level control a corresponding change in reflux flow. This also gives you internal reflux control as conditions change in terms of temperature. And it's, it's amazing how uh, uh, like a blue northern or a cold front coming in, cold rainstorm can really upset distillation columns. But if you have this sort of setup there, the, the changes in the, in, the, in the temperature of the overhead coming over, there is this internal compensation going on in terms of the, then the changes in receiver level uh, causing the change in reflux to automatically correct for that. And so tight level control provides you this internal reflux control inherently. And uh, this is actually the best control scheme if, uh, you know, if you have the, the situation um, where you got top temperature control 
and um, you know you, you're trying to deal with small disk with flow. Now, if you have a large disk with flow, it might lead you then to having a level controller disk with receiving manipulating disk with flow. And in this case, uh, you've lost the in an inherent internal reflux control, um, and, and and now. Uh, you, you really don't need tight level control. In fact, maybe you don't want tight level control because as you manipulate that dissolute flow to downstream users, it can be disruptive. Um, so here we have a reflux to feed ratio control going. Now, if you're doing bottom temperature control and you have a large bottom flow, then uh, hey, that's probably a better case for bottom temperature control because you can manipulate the bottom flow directly and uh, you want loose level control. And so you don't upset downstream users because the level control is really not affecting column of temperature control. And the temperature controller is uh, manipulating the steam flow uh, to the uh, reboiler. Now, if you have a small bottoms flow, you get into, well, I can't maybe really do level control. Now, the level uh, control is going to have to manipulate steam flow, and you get into inverse response, and this becomes a, a challenge, and then uh the uh, uh the the feed forward signal of steam to feed ratio control becomes even more important um and uh you, you need to uh, do what you can to minimize that inverse response um as much as possible well sorry i went over and i guess i didn't meet my goal like i thought i could of uh being under the time, normal time, and I, I realize that uh, some of you had to leave. Are there some questions that maybe uh, I can address? I know this was a lot to absorb. Yeah, Hector. And I was I was to ask you about um, uh, you were showing uh, understanding the dynamics, and then um, there was a, a slide where you were showing the loop lag. You were saying that that, that is the controller output path lag. Is this really yeah. the, the loop dead time? What what you refer us as the loop lag here? Uh, well, let me go back. Yeah, I think that block diagram is very helpful and. In terms of, uh, I guess, really defining what I, I meant, but you look at that load upset at the top there. We've got in there. We've got a delay, a lag, and a gain. Uh, and so th those are the load delays, load lags, and load gains. Then what is the loop? And this is a very good question. But if you look between the controller output and the point of entry of the disturbance, we see that there is uh, uh, two delays, one associated with a valve and one associated with a secondary delay associated with the process. So the loop delay would be the summation of the uh, valve delay and the secondary process delay. Then what would be uh, the lag, the loop lag? Well. Uh, you would take the largest lag, whether it's a valve lag or the secondary lag in the process, and that would be uh, the loop lag. And, um, and like I say, for the header pressure control system, the secondary lag there was negligible, and so it all came down to uh, the loop lag being what's in the valve. And this happens a lot in flow and pressure control processes. And and then the gain, uh, we see the loop gain. Uh, that gets a you know a little bit more complicated, perhaps as I as I threw, say, but it's principally affected at this point uh, by the valve gain. And and then uh, how that's then going to propagate through the loop. And uh, I'm going to send you a copy of these uh, uh, slides as a PDF file. Uh, so that you can uh, look at them. And, and I have to admit that I should have probably actually done a typical calculation for um, for the more complex case of uh, 
of how you uh, set the feed forward gain. Uh, you know, for as I mentioned, for uh, it's really nice for pressure and level that <laughs> the feed forward gain is one if we're dealing with mass flows. Yeah. Uh, but that's a that's a very good question, uh, and uh, really this again is why this block diagram is uh, so useful in, in terms of uh, really telling you what's going on. Uh, any other questions? Probably the other question that I would have is, uh, I was thinking how to to measure. That uh, lower offset gain. Because uh, uh, when, when, yeah. when you make a bump then, the cadena in the process, or by trying to turn the process dynamics, you would know by how much you, you change your output and what has a change there. But in the disturbance, there's not necessarily available information that you kind of calculate these things, even the delay. Yeah. Yeah, it gets to be a little complicated because it also depends upon your feed forward scale. And I apologize, um, I didn't really work through an example. I guess uh, uh, because the flow and pressure was so simple, um, but you need to take into account what is the change in the process variable uh, for a change in the disturbance variable. And then you need to take into account what is the change, of course, in the process variable for a change in your controller output. And you have to then make sure that dimensionally you end up with a, a gain that is uh, the change in uh, your controller output, your change in per CO, uh, divided by your change in your disturbance variable and make sure that the units uh, work out right. And, uh, and you got to take into account your feed forward scale gain uh, in, in that as well. So um, I, I tell you what, uh, as, as a separate thing, uh, I'll, I'll try and work out an example of that uh, because uh, it is a little confusing, and needless to say, particularly when you take into account the effect of feed forward scales in the, say, if you're doing a feed forward summer. Um, and uh, I guess if you're doing it separately and uh, talking about uh, a ratio block, uh, maybe. Uh, I have to even take a take a look at whether the ratio block has a scale or not. Um, it may then be affected by the, the ratio block scale. Um, so uh, it, it's not as straightforward to come up with the right uh, uh, feed forward gain, whether it's a, a ratio gain or a feed forward gain in the controller if you're dealing with uh, composition, pH, and uh, temperature. Um, if you're just dealing with mass flows, it, it can be uh, a lot simpler. Mass flows uh, being determining uh, uh, pressure and level, and and, and maybe uh, and maybe thickness, and uh, you know, uh, it, could, it could be that simple. But anyway. Uh, that is a very good point, uh, and uh, I think it's, the software setup uh, that is normally being used uh, to identify the tuning um, of a PID by identifying the process gain, what they call the process gain, but it's really an open loop gain. When you when they do the setup of that, they are really uh, at, should be asking for things like uh, scales of the PID controller, and uh, if it's not, there's a, there's a problem with the software being used for identification. Um, but uh, I think the same software could be used for identifying um, the uh, load or the disturbance variable uh, gain 
And then, uh, and speaking off the top of my head, uh, we, we, we could uh, just divide uh, that by the, uh, well, anyway, take, take the ratio of the disturbance variable gain and, and, and the process gain for feedback control to come up uh, with what the uh, feed forward gain is. But it, it really gets a little more complicated in terms of, uh, like I say, uh, what the scaling has done wherever that feed forward or, uh, is being set in terms of its effect. But um, yeah, uh, I've kind of apologized for not uh, maybe working through a calculation here of the feed forward gain. But I'll provide that. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, it's a good topic in itself. So one thing we have learned is that, interestingly enough, and in that the feed forward summer. At least in the DCS system we were using, if there was a negative value being computed of the feed forward signal due to the steam generation being greater than steam usage in that header, even though you had the feed forward scale set to be uh, zero at its low value, and say the valve had a capacity of um, zero to 100,000 pounds per hour, and you had your feed forward scale set at zero to 100,000. We found that internally in the feed forward summer, there was taken into account that negative value. And, and um, uh, it would cause a disruption uh, in the feed forward signal when that thing changed. And I, I, I have to do more recollection of what it was. But again, it comes down to understanding and testing um, what's being done. What we really needed to do is to make sure that we never uh, generated a negative feed forward signal coming into the feed forward summer. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was a surprise because uh, we never saw any documentation where we, we needed to uh, prevent a, a negative feed forward signal coming in. Uh, because the scale was set zero to 100,000 uh, pounds per hour, we thought we were all protected anyway. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you guys and, and gals and everybody involved here. And uh, uh, we're looking forward to, uh, Hector, are you gonna do the next one next, next month? Yes. Okay, so Hector is gonna do uh, the, the April web, web seminar. So uh, look forward to that. We really appreciate uh, uh, people doing this. Um, and uh, you know, I uh, sometimes what I give is a little bit too much. <laughs> so and it's a different uh, viewpoint. And uh, so we really appreciate having the proteges uh, do the web seminars besides other resources. Thank you.